evening uh, on behalf of Kaiser Miller's International Academy of Media Studies and Foundation for South Indian Studies. I welcome you all for the Madras Week 2020 Lecture 4 that is on Arkad Nawabs of Madras, Arkad Nawabs in Madras. Uh, this is a series of lectures we have been doing ever since the Madras Week started and the lectures have been online. Uh, today I am going to be talking about uh, Arkad Nawabs who have had a major impact on the city ever since they moved into the city. Um, just since I am operating this, give me a minute as I need to put the PowerPoint also in place. The PowerPoint will start. Just give me a second. Now, going back to you know, who are these Arkad Nawabs? You know, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, they are also known by Nawabs of Karnataka. Uh, Arkad Nawabs, the story goes a little earlier to the days of Golgonda. Uh, when Golgonda fell, the Mughal forces moved down to south. And uh, the Marathas, who were also on the run, they were holed up in uh, Senji, which was a major fortress near Arkad. The Mughal army, which came along with Zulfikar Ali Khan, uh, under the command of Zulfikar Ali Khan, camped. They thought that the battle will be over very soon, but took more than six years. From 1692 onwards, 90 onwards, they have been there uh, for more than six years. And uh, since the battle took so long, the camp, the Mughal camp, came into a township. And that township became ultimately the capital. And the township was Arkad. And uh, that is how they get the name as the Nawabs of Arkad. Uh, now, among the Mughal, uh, the first uh, during uh, it came under the south, came under Tamil Nadu, came under the Mughal uh, command, and Zulfikar Khan was the first uh, uh, Nawab deputy. Uh, Nawab means basically a deputy of the Mughal. And uh, so we have, uh, before I go into it elaborately, let me tell you, uh, there are four different categories that we'll be talking about the Nawab. The first two Nawabs are direct appointees by Aurangzeb himself, uh, Zulfikar Khan and Daud Khan. Uh, the second set is known as the Nawaids. When Daud Khan is recalled, he appoints Sahatullah Khan, who comes from the Nawaid community. From there till Chanda Sahib, the line, Dost Ali Khan, Sadr Ali Khan, Sahatullah Khan too, uh, and uh, Chanda Sahib who nominates himself as a Nawab, then and dies. Uh, with that, the Nawayat line comes to an end. And then you have uh, the Walajas. The Walajas starts with Nawab Anwaruddin, and uh, the title itself comes much later. So the, even though Anwaruddin is the founder of the Walaja dynasty, uh, it's a uh, and Umdutul, it's an uh, Muhammad Ali Walaja comes, follows Anuruddin, and then subsequently you have Umdutul Umra. Uh, with that, uh, the Nawab, the actual power of the Nawabs ends. After that, what you have is only the title of Nawabs Azim Uddawla, Azimja, and uh, Gulam Gauz Khan. With Gulam Gauz Khan, the Nawabship actually comes to an end. So now we'll go back to the beginning. I'll be slightly going back and forth. Now, if you go to Arkad, almost, you know, uh, there is no memory of the old fort, you know, remnants of the old fort left. This is all you get to see in Arkad. And uh, just a mosque and a tank uh, in front of it. Um, I think a lot of it was destroyed uh, by the British, you know, later on for security reasons, for safety reasons. Uh, now we'll go to the first Nawab, who is uh, Zulfikar Ali Khan. He comes and uh, he battles uh, the Marathas. The Marathas are holed up in a citadel, which is very um, well guarded. And it's very easy for anyone to break into it. So with that kind of a citadel, uh, it's, uh, but still people feel that you know, it could have been taken uh, very quickly. But the time that's taken, 
they attribute various reasons to it. Uh, one of the reasons is that Zulfikar Ali Khan was probably in collusion with the Marathas uh, because the Emperor Aurangzeb was already aging and either he did not want to go or he wanted to stay here, go to some other assignment after completing it or want to stay here or there was active collusion with the Marathas. Interesting things happen at that point of time in South and uh, Aurangzeb, you know, gets a bit probably in you know, a suspicious and he sends his own prince, Tambaksh. Uh, to go and look after this. Kambaksh comes, Kambaksh, Prince Kambaksh also, you know, everyone, you know, we all know that the Mughal throne, uh, when the father dies, the children actually scramble for their own security. And uh, Kambaksh is actually planning for uh, succeeding his father. So he tries to make a deal with the Marathas and uh, Zulfikar Ali Khan actually comes to know about it and he arrests Kambaksh. You know, this is a strange thing, you know, prince, Mughal prince being arrested, the emperor's son being arrested by Zulfikar Ali Khan. And Aurangzeb doesn't seem to mind that. Probably he also understands all this politics. But another interesting aspect of that is one of the local chief, chieftains, known as the Achamma Nayak, uh, Telugu chieftain from Kalasi, he looks at this entire siege happening and he feels that. Uh, uh, this man is wasting his time deliberately and he actually writes a letter to Aurangzeb saying that, you know, give me command, I'll take over this fortress you know, within a period of a week. Unfortunately, the letter gets caught with uh, Zulfikar Ali Khan. He doesn't reveal it. He calls uh, Yachama Naik for a meeting and kills him, you know, makes it like an accident and uh, kills him. Uh, but the most interesting thing is finally Senji falls. You know, when Senji falls, Aurangzeb sends a letter to uh, his chief asking him to come back to Delhi, handing it over to Swaran Singh, another uh, Rajput chieftain. So it's not actually handed over to another Mughal. Aurangzeb hands it over to another Hindu chieftain and uh, asks Zulfikar Khan to come back. And But before coming back, he says that Zulfikar Khan should actually go to uh, uh, Yachama Nayak's uh, capital and uh, put his son on throne and comes back. Probably Aurangzeb was aware of the mission since you know what his uh, deputy did and he wanted to make amen for that. Now Zulfikar Khan's time we also find that when they're fighting the Marathas they were also stretched, uh, stretched for money so there are times he actually sends his jewelry to Madras you know, to be pledged, the women's jewelry to be pledged because they have to say, pay the salaries of the, the soldiers uh, and there are blockades, so, so that's the kind of uh, first, you know, their setting put into Madras comes. Uh, there are blockades because the East India Company also, you know, gets into acts. East India Company is into slave trading, which the Mughals, you know, don't appreciate, and uh, they are into various other things. And there are a number of blockades. But uh, once Senji is one, Zulfikar Khan leaves, and uh, he leaves his deputy behind, known as Dawud Khan Bani. And uh, Daud Khan Pani becomes uh, next uh, Nawab. Uh, now, if you go to Arkad and during the time the city actually starts growing, uh, you'll find this Daud Khan Chowk slightly outside uh, the Arkad city now, uh, what it is Arkad today. And this is one of his uh, favorite uh, Sufi's Darga, which he has built over there. Um, but the Daud Khan Pani was also very interesting Nawab in the sense uh, uh, he was also wary of the Britishers and uh, uh, he tried to keep them in check and many times you know blockades of Madras happened. Uh, time once when he came to Madras he wanted to actually visit uh, Fort St. George and uh, he made a request uh, to the Fort St. George governor that he wants to visit. Uh, the governor was a perturbed, you know why does the Nawab want to come to Fort St. George, you know we will come and meet. Uh, they worried because Daud Khan was also moving with a big army and uh, the British also feared that they could any time take over the fort. So, but that basis said, no, it won't be when the Nawab you know, himself invites him in, you can't refuse, it won't be the uh, right thing to do. So, they pleaded that, you know, the fort cannot accommodate the entire army of the Nawab. So, rather, you know, he comes with a smaller uh, retinue. And uh, Daud Khan actually gets into the Fort St. George, the smaller retinue. And uh, he was very fond of liquor. And uh, they play him with liquor. 
and a uh, little later you know they get four villages five villages uh, four villages and then one more gets added five villages uh, from him as a grant for the company uh, that company goes back then comes a few days later again you know say that he wants to visit the fort now the governor is all worried you know the man just came we entertained him and why does he want to come again so they try to delay dally they don't you know they keep talking daud company waits near santom he camps he gets into a church he gets drunk and gets into a nearby church and sleeps away later on he wakes up and then angrily he goes back and then says you know give me back the four villages so that is a fight you know that lingers on but uh, despite this man being uh kind of liquor and he asked one of the most sensible questions to the british at that point of time you are traders why do you need fort and guns you know that was the thing the outcome uh pani asked the britishers uh, but when aurangzeb died and the battle of succession you know started raging in delhi uh, his uh, earlier chief zulfikar khan asked daud khan to come come to delhi to help him and there he goes and he dies over there but when he leaves he leaves his deputy as the next nawab who is saatullah khan his original name is mohammed saeed and uh, we find that uh, uh, one of the most ablest of the carnatic nawabs will be saatullah khan and uh, saatullah khan comes to power and he builds arcad to a very big uh, city as what it is today i mean with gardens and all that it takes a number of years uh, but during his time everything was kept under check uh, now the saatullah khan is known for a few things one is raja day singh another thing is one of the very interesting thing is the nawab period uh, is the vardhraja permar temple the inscription found over there apparently 1688 you know that is when the golconda actually fell and there was disturbance there were so many forces around in this part of the region the marathas had come so there was unrest and there was a power vacuum so fearing that you know the temple could come under uh, damage uh, the vardhraja permar temple authorities you know moved the deity uh, to udayar palayam distant udayar palayam but once the uh, uh, trouble was over and the mughals had come to power they asked udayar palayam zameen to you know give back the palekara to give back the deity and uh, he wasn't willing to give so finally an appeal was made to saatullah khan and it was saatullah khan with his uh, deputies todarmal uh, dakini rai sense of force and retribution so this is the kind of uh, the life that these nawabs led it was probably you know by then the mughal army also had a great amount of uh, various mix of soldiers including a hindu soldiers and the deputies of their ministers were all mostly hindus and uh, it's only natural that when you look at a uh, little later you know 1716 farukhshia who was a mughal emperor there was a request for uh, he gets the idol of chudi uh, kurta nachiya andal uh, to the bhaktavachala swami temple at solinga so with this kind of uh, example you know set by the rulers uh, the nawabs also you know carried the same tradition uh, as i said uh, Saatullah Khan was a great builder and he built many townships and um, uh, he was very wary of the british he had seen uh, the kind of arrogance that, with which uh, they even dealt with his boss uh, Daud Khan and also uh, Zulfikar Khan so he always wanted to keep them in check um, so there is a very interesting instance he wanted to keep uh, build a rival fort next to Madras right in Madras what is Madras today Uh, that is fort st george he wanted to build it in uh, in mailapur you know which was where the santom the portuguese had built and when british sense that the nawab is going to build a fort they became very wary because the nawab will give concessions and all the trade will go over there so they begged and pleaded finally they convinced the persuaded dakni rai to visit the nawab prime minister to visit um, fort st george and when the nawab's party came with the muslim generals and all that uh they were persuaded uh, to tell the nawab to convince the nawab not to build a fort right uh, rival harbor right over here but a little distant place and uh, when the party left on the way back they were met by uh, the tra- the business uh, the merchants 
the Armenian merchants who were living in palatial bungalows right underneath St. Thomas Mount. And they seem to have welcomed uh, the Nawab's party and uh, entertained them. After uh, being having their food and all that, they decided the Nawab's party, uh, the Kini Rai and the Muslim generals, they decided to climb up St. Thomas Mount to see the church. And the Padri was already waiting with the wine and all that to receive them. And uh, this is a very interesting instance where they went into the church and for the first time the Indians were being exposed to something called the European painting and uh, the three dimensional paintings, you know, built, I mean, painted all over the ceiling of that uh, church. It was initially built by the Portuguese. And when they saw that, they were completely in awe. And immediately, one of the Muslim generals, you know, sang the song, Oh, my European beloved. You know, he broke into a gazel poem, poetry. And uh, maybe it was a wine or whatever. Immediately, you know, others, once he stopped his uh, verse, somebody else picked it up. And there, it was a very beautiful moment. Right inside the church, the Hindu ministers and the Muslim generals all sitting together and singing songs in praise of Mother Mary. You know, that I always find is a very beautiful instance of uh, the kind of um, the syncretic traditions that we have followed in Madras with the Nawabs. And uh, after that, uh, the Nawab did, you know, build his fort, but uh, I mean, rival harbor, and he built it a uh, little farther away. That was at Kovala, and named it at uh, named it Sadat Bandar, Sadat Patan. And um, but I think he still felt that you know you need to keep in check because 17, 17, 17, 18, you had the battle of Tirubattur with the Britishers. So he built. Uh, he, I, my understanding is that. He moved to, uh, he built a township closer to the British establishment at Saida Pet. So, Saida Pet actually, Sahatullah Khan's original name is Muhammad Saeed. And as I said, he was a builder. Uh, in Saida Pet, the old uh, Urdu documents, Persian documents talk about it, Saida Abad, Saeed Abad. So, what really today, you know, is there giving us a memory of that Nawab is that's a mosque, beautiful mosque, which you find over here. You know, with all that uh, on the ceiling for the acoustics and all that, um, it's named after him. Now, Salatullah Khan Juma Masjid. That's the only thing that's always saying that adjacent to it, there's a Patwal street. Now, um, Salatullah Khan ruled very ably, one of the best Nawabs among the Carnatic Nawabs, but he died in 1732. And uh, with that, uh, the other Nawabs where he did not have a successor. And uh, you had a whole lot of other Nawabs, as I said, Sattar Ali Khan, Jost Ali Khan, again, Saad Ali Khan, who came as a small prince. Uh, but meanwhile, there was some other climate to the throne. And uh, that was a very ambitious man. Uh, his name is uh, Chanda Sahib. And uh, he actually was becoming almost a threat to the existing Nawab. So they also wanted to keep in check. And the uh, stories are that uh, Chanda Sai went to Truchi and he pulled uh, the Queen Meenakshi over there. Uh, he actually assured her of uh, protection, but then later on took over the fort. There are stories about the way he took over the fort. Um, but whatever it be, uh, he became, he almost you know, became a Nawab over there. And uh, one of the very other interesting aspects of Chanda Sai is that his friendship, his friendship with uh, Uh, Bill Beschi. Uh, Beschi was one of those uh, scholars, Tamil scholars, I'm Christian Jesuit priests who had come. Uh, and uh, the, these two you know, developed friendship in a little earlier. And uh, he became so close that Chanda Sahib was supposed to appoint Beschi as uh, his Diwan. And, uh, but later on, the Marathas invaded. And when the Marathas invaded, the Nawabs who were in Arka themselves, you know, wanted, did not help. Uh, Chanda Sahib did not get help from them. And uh, Beschi couldn't do much. And Chanda Sahib, and after a different uh, thing, he was taken away as prisoner to Satara. So there comes an interlude when he is cooling his heels in Satara. And Beschi, uh, disappointed and disillate, you know, he is supposed to have moved away from Tuchi and went to down south somewhere to Manapad and died uh, over there, you know, a little later. Uh, but uh, when this all this confusion was happening, uh, the Nizam 
of Hyderabad, who was the immediate overlord of uh, the Nawab of Arkad, he sent uh, Nawab Anurudin, uh, Anurudin to oversee, to help to be the regent of the young prince you know, who has come to the throne. Anurudin came here and uh, within uh, no time, this young prince you know, got killed, you know, supposed to have been killed by Afghans. Uh, but there is also a rumor that you know there could have been a hand of the Anuruddin also. Uh, now these are all you know, palace intrigues and all that one is not really sure. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, 1744 from 1744 it was Anuruddin who took over as the Nawab. And uh, Anuruddin, if you go his presence, you will find in uh, Triplicate in, in Big Street you will find this Masjid Anuruddin and uh, very old style with a nice courtyard and all that, uh, small though. So this was Anwaruddin's time. But uh, that was also the time uh, when this was all happening, there was also major changes, tectonic changes that are happening in Delhi. Uh, 1939, Nadir Shah invades Delhi and the Mughal power is broken. And uh, Ahmad Shah is blinded, the Mughal emperor is blinded and uh, they become weak. Uh, so these changes have its repercussions and the European powers, colonial powers around this area, including the British and uh, the French, they all start developing their own ambitions. And uh, you have uh, Dupley at that point of time here as governor of Pondicherry. So he tries to um, carry on the enmity. He also tries to you know, get as much as territory as possible. They are slightly came behind the Britishers to this part, but uh, tried to gain territory. And uh, in so he encourages Chanda Sahib. So the Britishers encourage uh, an, uh, or with um, Anwaruddin and uh, Chanda Sahib is supported by Dupley. So Dupley actually helped Chanda Sahib to be released from the Marathas and he pays the ransom and he comes over here. Uh, when he comes in battle, in a battle at Ambur, uh, Anuruddin is killed treacherously. And uh, Mahfuz Khan, the eldest brother of Muhammad Ali, uh, the eldest son of uh, Anuruddin is captured as prisoner. Uh, younger son uh, Muhammad Ali actually goes away to Pichi and uh, holds himself inside the fort in Pichi. And uh, there is a siege of Pichi. Uh, Chanda Sahib wants to finish them over there. Uh, so uh, there, it is at that point of time that uh, the company emerges as a major force because one, Anuruddin is not from this area, neither, uh, I mean, his son, they are not from this area, they are from somewhere in UP, from a place called Hardoy. And uh, so they do not have many friends over here. So they already have enough enemies because uh, Nawab's, uh, the courtiers, the nobility all consists at that point of time of the Nawais, you know, which belongs to another clan. And uh, there are many other enemies, you know, the French, and the Marathas on the prowl, and the Mysore forces, you know, that are also trying to, you know, uh, take territory. So with all this, the only friend that uh, the Nawab Muhammad Ali get at that point is British. And uh, Stringer Lawrence comes in, helps, uh, uh, Balaja, at that point of time, is known as Muhammad Ali, helps him, and uh, that enables uh, Muhammad Ali to lay claim. Chanda Sahib is killed in the battle. Uh, uh, I mean, he's not in the battle. He's uh, he goes away to take refuge in uh, with the Marathas to Tanjavur, where he is killed by the Marathas. Uh, so from then on, the ascendancy is with the British. And uh, Clive also, you know, plays his role at that point of time in Arkad. And uh, this is known as the Delhi Gate from which, you know, Clive is uh, supposed to have said we'll march to Delhi. Uh, it's still there in Delhi. So by 54, you know, all these pay people are playing the games. Uh, so Dupley actually, you know, starts uh, dictating terms. And uh, he, uh, having won the Battle of uh, Adia with the uh, Malthus Khan, Dupley is actually seen has a better uh, uh, impression on the Mughals than many other rulers. So he tries to, you know, portray himself as Nawab. He offers, you know, the negotiations just as a kind of a deploy. But he wants his own people to be in control. And uh, but uh, the French lose out on the thing. Dupley goes 
uh, the British get uh, the upper hand. Finally, with the help of uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Pondicherry is taken. And uh, with that, the French dominance of this area comes to an end. But uh, nevertheless, at this point of time, as I said earlier, Muhammad Ali you know, felt helpless. You know, there are all around him, there are enemies. You know, his own brothers were not supporting. Mahfuz Khan goes to Madurai and declares himself as Nawab. And his another brother, you know, elsewhere, he also tries to declare himself as Nawab. So there is no one to support. And uh, the earlier nobility, as it's Sampat Rai, all of them are in support of others. So he feels that, you know, the Trichy could be, you know, with Mysore and other forces, you know, constantly on the prowl, Marathas, you know, constantly on the prowl. He needed a safe place and he thought being closer to the British would be a safe thing. And he moves over to Chennai, uh, Madras. And it is said that, you know, initially he asked for a place, you know, whenever he comes. Much before him, other Nawabs also, you know, send their people to Chennai. And like that, you know, even Chanda Sahib sent his family to, for safekeeping when he was away uh, to the French Pondicherry. So it was there and uh, there was a palace street which was also a place was allotted for the nawab inside the palace uh, which still is there in his palace street but there are also a different op opinions saying that it was never so because uh well, muhammad ali understood that you know uh, the chanda Sai clan doesn't have credibility among the people mainly because they are under the french guns and if he is going to be he being the lord of this territory if he is going to be under the protection of the British guns, he will not be respected by his subjects either. So he actually chose a place a little further from Fort St. George across the river Kuwam, and he bought uh, Chepak, and there he built his palace. And it is believed that uh, the Chepak palace was built by Paul Benfield. And uh, But as I said, Muhammad Ali did not have much money. You know, Ever since they came, they have been fighting wars and uh, the British had been sending bills, even though helping, they had been sending bills. And uh, Muhammad Ali was not much of a trader and uh, had to, you know, borrow money at expensive rates. And uh, But uh, once he moved in, he wanted to, you know, uh, what is worthy of a Nawab, he wanted to build a capital. You know, having decided to move from Arka to Chennai, uh, here he wanted to have a nice palace and other establishments. And uh, the Chepak Palace came about. Uh, built, supposed to be a bit built in one of the indo saracenic uh, architectural style. That is what many of them claim. Uh, but I have my own differences because you find that this sort of a style already existed during the Nayak period, during the Vijayanagara period. And if you go to Madurai, if you see Thirumala Nayak's uh, palace, then you find these kind of you know architectural uh, details over there. Uh, this has already come into force. I think this kind of combination of Persian, Turkic along with uh the deccan the dravidian you know all this mix was happening but nevertheless many of them believe that this is supposed to be one of the earliest of the indo saracenic architecture the palace you know once occupied more than 300 acres uh it faced the sea and it had uh, two wings uh, kalas mahal and uh, the humayun mahal uh, then there was a bathing section of the marine villa uh, but they couldn't really decorate it much uh, there are uh, talks about, uh, there are stories about that. Um, but once he built that, uh, he was, uh, Muhammad Ali, as I said, he brought out many friends, he was depending on his sons. And uh, his, one of his able son was uh, Amir Urumra. Uh, he is there, you know, in both the portraits we find Amir Urumra. Yesterday, my friend Sapna Satish, you know, when she spoke, she spoke of the other painting where you know this actually gives you uh, the hair the lineage you know who is going to take over after uh, but unfortunately you know amirul umra dies in 1788 and uh, so his uh, elder brother uh, has to take over uh, the throne uh, but meanwhile the other things as i said one of the biggest enemies initially for them for balaja was a mysore and then mysore is taken uh, hyder ali takes over mysore uh, reigns and subsequently, Tipu Sultan, um, the enmity continues. Uh, so there are peace overtures, but uh, Walaja is not willing with Hyder Ali's family at one point of time work for the Nawabs of Arkad. Uh, that was not the only thing, probably, you know, because he was also wary of Hyder Ali's designs. But by then, by the third Mysore war, when Hyder Ali uh, loses and his sons are brought as hostages to Madras, that's when I think Walaja and others, you know, they realize that the power is slipping from them. 
uh, this is Hyderali uh, sons being given as hostages. And Walaja actually you know, goes and visits the sons who were kept as hostages. Uh, I mean, there are different things as in College Road or Pantheon Road. Pantheon is where they are supposed to have been kept as hostages today, where the museum is. And uh, he's supposed to have uh, uh, been very felt bad about them being as hostages and regretted the whole incident. Uh, but still, as I said, you know, you move over your capital, it's not enough. You know, you need to build other things. You know, you just built a palace that is not enough for an administration. So during Walaja's time, it was that a whole lot of the North Indian population, I wouldn't say the Urdu Muslims, I would say the North Indian populations in Madras owe it mainly to Walaja, you know, owe it to the Nawabs and uh, basically to Walaja in Madras. Uh, because with, as I said, the Mughal army, you know, consisted of Hindu soldiers also, considerable amount, you know, by the time Aurangzeb came, there was a considerable Rajput element to it, and there was a Maratha elements also to it. So, when uh, uh, Walaja moved, Muhammad Ali, he got the title Walaja for the conquest of uh, Pondicherry, along with the British from the Mughal Empire. Uh, when he moved his capital and started uh, building, uh, he invited a whole lot of people and his ministers, many of the ministers and uh, some of the generals were uh, Hindus. And uh, he went about uh, building a big uh, mosque also. It's known as the big mosque now. It's the Walaja uh, mosque. It's, it's again in triplicate. What you find over there is uh, the big mosque. And um, the very, one of the interesting thing is you find the syncretic tradition being maintained by these Nawabs throughout. And uh, his uh, ministers, one of his pions, uh, Munshis, was Raja Makanlal Kirad. And uh, Raja Makanlal Kirad, uh, there is this interesting aspect of something called chronogram. One of the beautiful lifestyles of the olden days. Chronograms are one when the Mughals and uh, it's a uh, vestation phenomena probably you know, started from the Greeks. Uh, when they wrote something, instead of mentioning the year directly, what they would do is, they will use the alphanumerical. So every alphabet, you know, has a numerical. Before the numerical things came, alphabets were used for numerical value. And every letter had a numerical value. So they will compose a verse. And if you add the numerical value of the, each letter, that will give you the year of the writing of the book, or a path being built, or a palace being built, or it could be even death also. When uh, Humayun died, you know, picking up a book from his uh, uh, ladder, from his library, I believe the verse was on dusk he fell. So when you add it up, it gives you the year of uh, Humayun's death. Uh, this is one of the Abjadi system, so in Persian, and uh, many others fall when, when Jews were expelled out of Spain, and thus they scattered. A biblical verse was used, which gives you the year of expulsion as 1492. Uh, so it's a widely practiced, you know, from uh, Middle East to uh, India, for all the, the Mughals, all of them were practicing. And when Saadullah Khan built the township, when he built uh, Arkad, when he built a park, again for that, you know, somebody you know, wrote a chronogram, a verse. So like that, when the mosque was constructed, a competition was held as to, you know, for a good chronogram. And uh, the person who won that chronogram was uh, ultimately a Hindu, uh, Raja Makhanlal Kira. And the most interesting aspect is that chronogram is what you see over here. And uh, uh, Dikrullahi Akbar, you know, that is what, and it gives you the year, the uh, Arabic, uh, the Hijri, Hijra year, the Islamic calendar, uh, which corresponds to 1794. So we get the year by that name. Uh, the thing is, this is placed right above the Mehra, you know, that is where the priest stands and conducts uh, prayer. So the Nawaz of Arkad did not feel that, you know, a Hindu's uh, verse is right over there. Uh, that differentiation was not there. That apart, uh, there's another interesting story of Walaja is that the Kapalishwar temple. Uh, the Kapalishwar temple, the tank as we see today, it's a nice huge tank. Uh, I believe one of the ministers of Walaja 
a Hindu minister wanted the tank to be enlarged. Uh, but the problem was Mailapur then. Today it has a different kind of a demography. But uh, then it had a large Muslim component. And uh, initially the Tamil Muslim, but later on with the Nawabs coming in and the other Muslims. With the Portuguese coming in, I think the Muslims kind of you know, moved from that area. Uh, but later on with the Golganda and the Nawabs coming in, the Muslims again came over. And the profile of the Muslims changed into the Urdu speaking Muslims. And um, there were many Fakirs who were living right next to the temple, right next to the small pond that was over there. So when the minister made the request, Walaja asked the Fakirs to move away, you know, so that they could enlarge the tank. But the Fakirs were unwilling. You know, you have all these hot-headed things, you know, who would think of other religious things. As a, there was some reason they were unwilling, uh, they uh, refused. So what Walaja is supposed to have done is, uh, there is yet another Darga in Palavram, another martyr, you know, who died fighting the Portuguese here in the Santo, uh, known as Buddha Sahib. And uh, his, uh, his body is... Its head is supposed to have fallen in Palavram and there's a Darga over there. And it used to be the tradition that the practice that all the Fakirs will go for the Kanduri, you know, the annual uh, paying of respects to the Sufi saint buried over there. And it used to be a 14 day event. So Walaja is supposed to issue an edict saying that all the Fakirs in Madras, in this territory, will have to compulsorily attend the ceremony. 14 day ceremony at uh, the Buddha Sahib Darga. So once the Fakirs vacated uh, the premises, the Mailapur temple tank, Walaja is supposed to have gone ahead with enlarging the tank. When the Fakirs came back, they understood what had happened. Uh, I again understand that the tradition was that when you make a complaint, you have to produce the accused within a year. And if you don't produce accused within a year, then the complaint actually you know, is uh, removed. So for a year, the Hindu minister was hidden. And uh, once that was over, uh, the minister came back. But this is how the tank got extended. Uh, so even today, Muslims have a right over the tank during Muharram processions and all that. So this is, again, another aspect of the syncretic tradition that the Arka Nawabs are famous for. Now, uh, Walaja, despite all his you know, attempts, uh, he couldn't. He kept on. He fought wars. English fought wars along with him, but then they finally kept sending him bills, too expensive bills, that he won territories, but kept losing them to uh, the British, you know, for paying the bill for the war. Uh, the early, you know, early days of the corporate, the company, he was not, he couldn't really um, tackle the company with different directors, you know, scheming. It was just simply difficult for Walaja. And uh, by the time he died, he realized that most of the power was gone from him. So his own successor, whom he wanted, Amir Umra, was nowhere in the scene. He had already died. And Undutur Umra, who was more of a poet, uh, he ascended the throne. And he did it, you know, very uh, stealthily because uh, he was very wary of the Britishers that they might demand, make demands on him, you know, asking concessions. So without even announcing, though uh, Fort St. George is just across the river Kuba, without even announcing, the, no, making the company know that uh, Walaja had died, his father Muhammad Ali had died, uh, he came to the throne. And the British were furious you know, when they understood that uh, this had happened. But then they reconciled, but uh, they still kept seeming as to how to bring down, take over the Karnatic, you know, completely. Uh, by then, you know, most of the administrative uh, powers had been lost, the territory has been lost to the British, but still Nawab was a force and uh, they were ruling. Uh, but uh, one of the things of Umdhat Umra is that he was very close to his sister, Sultan Unisa Begum, and she was considered to be the de facto ruler. And uh, she, at that point of time, uh, felt that uh, after her brother, it will be her son, Raisul Umra, who will come to power. And uh, Somewhere, since he didn't want to displace his sister or so, either he agreed it or whatever. Uh, but Sultan Unisa Beham grew with the idea that it will be her son who will be the next Nawab. And uh, she was very fond of uh, Umdhat Rumra. She used to send uh, uh, a one rupee coin every day for him to tie on his uh, uh, hand and uh, go to bed. 
to what are given you know that sort of uh, closeness and uh, the nawab also he was not very close to his wife and he used to spend most of the evenings at his sister's palace uh, meeting officials and uh, entertainment and all that it was a dance tradition which i'll talk to you later uh, but when he was ailing in 1801 uh, sultan nisa understood that she came to realize that it will not be her son who will become the next nawab it will probably uh, umdat umrah's son and she became angry and furious and a woman scorned and uh, the nawab was lying in his deathbed almost in coma and um, as you said already you know money was a major problem and his divan was uh, colonel barrett who was a half portuguese and the reason why he became uh, the divan was that he could get money borrow money uh, that was the reason why he became the divan now the poor, uh, english were very contemptuous of this uh, divan but uh, in the end they colluded with him and ensured that when the nawab was lying in his deathbed almost unconscious they said you know there could be the sister could be sister and others could be planning a coup against the nawab and the nawab will be better protected by the company's forces and uh, they moved the company's forces into the chapa into the palace where uh, umdat umra was residing and uh, when he woke up he found himself surrounded by the company soldiers effectively almost a prisoner and he couldn't do anything so when he died the uh, palace was effectively in the hands of east india company and uh, so then they started dictating the shots uh, this is something that you will find even today when you go to triplicane high road this is known as kaman darwaza uh, the old picture you know shows the entrance to where uh, photograph the uh, 20th century photograph shows the entrance to sultan umsa begum's palace and uh, a bitter sultan umsa begum uh did not allow the coffin of her brother to pass through this gate you know it had to go through this gate to another place which i'll come to it later and uh, the coffin was kept right in front of this and uh, today you find that in azim pet it's renamed as azim pet uh and they had to take through another route uh but this effectively you know meant this brought an end to the nawab's uh, total uh, rule you know the political power uh the british you know side by side they negotiated with uh, another person and uh, umrath umrah's own son taj umrah who was a poet he lost out uh, he was not willing to the company wanted him to sign away all the territories and he was not willing to do it uh, so side side by side the company was already beginning negotiations with another clan of the nawabs and uh, uh, they made him nawab he was willing to sign away because he had nothing to lose and all the administrative political powers were taken away from the nawabs and they were pensioned off they became title nawabs the procession was actually supposed to go to dastagir sahib darga which is at the end of uh, this road sort of station uh, road and uh, you find the darga over there now one of the aspects of these nawabs was as i said they try to you know bring in people uh, the north indians the hindu scholars came muslim scholars came uh, at the time uh, varaja himself was into uh, mystical traditions he followed the chistia tradition uh, and uh, he initiated his son umdatul umrah into other traditions uh, but i think nakshabandhya was one of the dominant traditions at that point of time uh, in central asia and here so he wanted uh, dasagi sahib who was a follower who followed the nakshabandhi uh, mystical order he invited him to madras by 1950s probably where he felt madras was comfortable and uh, uh, when uh, from here when uh, dasigi sahib went away to hyderabad on the way he died in the burying the place called ramatabad uh, but varaja did not want the body, body to be left there so he brought it here after a few months and uh, it's interred right over here in madras and when varaja died he had a request he was in constantly in touch with the sultan of Turan, turkey and Uh, also you know the ones who controlled uh, the kaaba the mecca he was sending ships he was sending pilgrimage materials there is a ruba a place for uh, pilgrims from madras uh, to go and stay in mecca and uh, so his request was that his body should be buried under the staircase of mecca so but they when they sent the letter took time so temporarily for two years you know for till they got a reply from mecca the body was temporarily interred at this place which is right adjacent right under the gaze of dastagir sahib and uh, but uh, two years later they got the message 
that you know they can't mecca will not allow such thing because the moment you allow such uh, privileges everybody would want to be buried in mecca so that did not happen uh, so from here the next request was varaja wanted his body to be taken from here to trichy where his favorite uh, sufi uh, natarwali who is a sufi 1000 years old who came to these parts much before uh, the uh, delhi sultanate even came he was almost 1000 years back he came to trichy so that is where uh, uh, varaja wanted to be buried so the body was taken away from here similarly umdatul umra also when he died his body was temporarily interred here before it could be taken to trichy so the mystical orders are part of that uh, the one who came to power after them immediately as title nawab was nazam nawab azimuddaula you find here nawab azimuddaula with, with his son nawab azam ja uh, so azam ja you know ruled immediately for about 6 years but he died uh, quite uh, early and uh, with a very young son young kid and uh, then that's when gulam gaus khan comes to power uh, as a young boy so there is a regent his uncle uh, azam ja you know becomes a regent and he rules on behalf of him but uh, when he attains the age he comes to power um, and he is into by then they are basically you know pensioned off uh, living on uh, the carnatic pensions uh, but substantial amount of money so he indulges in mushaira poetry and all that so by then uh, till then persian was a language now urdu slowly comes into being it is only during his time that you know urdu poetry and other things get importance over here so he conducts a poetical assembly and uh, the government agent at that point of time with the nawab was edward balfour he was instrumental in getting the mohammedan public library and also the nawab's own uh, madrasa which was meant for the nobility and madrasa as we know today is something different from those days madrasas a madrasa was a place where a whole lot of subjects were taught it was not just religious text alone there could be still madrasas like that in elsewhere but at that point of time these are the madrasas so balfour you know made the uh, opened up the madrasa for the common man also which uh, the young nawab was also willing to do it's very interesting the kind of subjects that were taught you know arabic persian interestingly i don't think urdu was taught there was there a fiqh uh is a zero jurisdiction law okay mathematics unani medicine tamil english telugu so they were not uh, you know shoving down one language uh, you could le- learn as many languages as possible and people were learning at that point of time uh, and the interesting thing is again is if you look at the holidays of madras e azam one of the oldest schools you know muslims are just about two three holidays you know bakrid and uh, ramzan and ramzan sunny but if you are a hindu student you had a whole lot of holidays you know you had pongal you had diwali you had yagadashi pulya chauthi navratri triplicate yatra which i understand should be the temple ka festival uh, thiruval yatra mailapur temple ka festival and all that uh, the muslim students and teachers you know, generally friday was considered a holiday the christian teachers enjoyed sunday as a holiday it was a very inclusive thing you know the religion did not but there's one other thing of uh, which i found very interesting of the nawab is that uh, with the nawabs as i said uh, scholars came they also there was a court and uh, the nawabs are you know building a whole lot of things you know they are building infrastructure they are building township they are trying to re- uh, revive the economy all that they were doing you know it was not just enjoying music alone uh, in fact you know Ra- i would say walaja lost out because of raj dharm you know despite him having to borrow money at enormous interest from the britishers and others it was always that he ensured that uh, in his province the, the they maintain the price of rice you know if a price of rice goes up in certain area they will move the rice to there to bring down the price you know that sort of a thing was always there there was the langar khana you know to feed the poor so and the langar khana is a place very interestingly it had brahmin cooks because at that point of time only the uh, food cooked by the brahmin was acceptable to all communities so these considerations were always there and uh, with them also you know hindustani music made an entry into madras so hindustani music i would say you know at least you know has a 250 year old tradition in madras you know, which could be very surprising i myself was surprised it existed till 1980s now coming back to the last nawab so you find Uh, right from walaja days you know the court uh, umdatul umra you know pens poems and asks 
his favorite uh, dancer and the musician uh, musician to compose a poem and his favorite dancer sonam sona who is a hindu you know to dance to the tune and uh, that tradition is there with almost all the nawab the last nawab gulam gauss khan uh, they take over using doctrine of lapse uh, you know lack of male hair but i understand that you know he fell in love with the tawai a kanchanwala that is how they were known in this part of the region uh, a courtesan uh, her name is uh, jahangir hyderabadi and um, uh, it was a love affair you know about which uh, widely spoken about and uh, so that gives us you know an insight into the uh, dance and music tradition that existed so this area if you go flow if you go to tinaga i mean uh, the triplicate you will find ganabagh street which i think should have been as it was close to palace those would have been the place where uh, the musicians and dancers lived but later on when the nawab ship came to an end and it was abolished and they moved over there as prince of arcot to the current amir mahal it is around that locality at the st jani jahan khan street that all these musicians and dancers lived and again most interesting thing is in my field work what i found was that many of the dancers were Hindus and many of them came from uh, Hubli, Darwad Hubli area. And one of the last dancers, very famous dancer, her name was Sunita Gorkodi, and uh, her sister was Kamala Bai. Uh, so uh, this is the tradition that we owe to Nawabs. It existed till 1980s, and after that, it slowly faded away. Um, so i mean till 1980s you can understand you know from 1760 they moved in from there to 1980s so madras has had this very long tradition of hindustani music right in the heart of the city uh, now another uh, area before i close is that the language found in the arcad coins you, know, you find that in every act of theirs you know you find the secretive tradition you know is there this division of you know religion was never there uh, seeing people that way so the language interestingly is that uh, unlike other nawabs uh, the nawab of arcad issued coins or somebody issued on their name uh, they were in arabic english persian tamil and telugu and uh, one of the most interesting things is the tamil names you know you find saheb in their coins mahfuz mahfuz khan mahfuz nawab uh, chanda saheb also in issued coins and very interesting thing is you find sri ram Sri Rama, as you know, in the coins of the Arcad Nawabs, Muhammad Ali, you know that name you find over there. Um, so one of the thing is that uh, these coins, I think, probably appear after uh, 1740, 1739. Mostly, you know, when uh, Nadir Shah invaded, when the power of the Delhi Emperor was broken, the Mughal Emperor was broken. That is when probably they felt emboldened enough to issue coins. or their subjects here you know felt that they can issue coins and that is how we find these coins here uh, which gives us another insight in very interesting insight into the arcad nawabs um, now uh, in 1855 when the last nawab died the palace was taken over uh, due to carnatic debts and uh, they moved into a place called shadi mahal on uh, tripicane high road uh, but they were petitioning uh, the uncle azim ja who was also who was regent for a while he kept petitioning and 1857 happened queen victoria herself was not happy with the way company dealt with the whole thing so they did want to restore uh, thing but uh, they restored as prince of arcad amiri arcad so from then you have about uh, eight uh, prince of arcads today we have Muhammad Abdul Ali, who is the eighth Prince of Arcad, and he also continues. All of them have continued the tradition of their forefathers. So he ran something called Harmony India, which is again, you know, about communal harmony. Uh, so and uh, today, even today, when you go to Walajah Mosque during Ramzan, you will find that uh, in the mosque for the last two, three decades, it's the Hindu community, the Sindhi community, the Sufi that dress who come and. Uh, serve the gruel they prepare and serve the gruel to the muslims who are breaking the fast so that tradition is continued by the current generation now these are all things that i read from things uh, one of my uh, last thing that i want to say is that in my field work i was in a place called alwar tinagari which is down south uh, near tirunelveli 
and there i found that uh, when i was there was a story about an elephant running amok so i went to talk to the mahud and that man happened to be a muslim so when i was talking to him it is a tamil muslim settlement he said when i asked him how come that a tamil muslim is having you know is being a mort of an elephant which is very unusual he said no he is not a tamil even though he is living among all tamil muslims he is a dakini so i was intrigued and asked uh, the story he said no we came with uh, we came as gift of the arkad nawabs the arkad nawabs gifted uh, different temples in tamil nadu they gifted seven temples uh, elephants and uh, he named the temples i have uh, taken down notes one of it i know is uh, shri vilivathur and the other is alwar tirunelveli so the nawab is supposed to have gifted these temple uh, temples the elephants and uh, along the muslims were actually taking care of the elephants over there so he said the moment you know he goes to uh, shri vilivathur it will be his uh, friends his relatives you know who are taking care of the elephants over there so even today the tradition kind of exists in alwar tirunelveli the elephant is taken care by a muslim Uh, but these are the kind of stories you know that we still need to look at uh, there are empty number of documents there are a whole lot of documents which are in persian which unfortunately have not been translated you know which would give us another deeper insight into the arkad nawabs but what comes through in all these stories as i understand in all these records as i understand is that uh, they upheld a certain secular and uh, syncretic tradition and that continues today to have an impact on chennai madras city as such so arkan nawabs impact on madras in its current uh, secret tradition is considerable so with this i end my presentation thank you uh, please post your comments as questions i like Balaji Tandabani wants to ask: Was the Thousand Lights Mosque built by Arkan Nawaz? Uh, very interesting. Thanks, uh, Balaji. Uh, this, you know, one area which I left out. Uh, among the Arkan Nawabs, uh, there are the Shias. Uh, there is this belief that uh, Umm Tulumra was more lenient, you know, more close to Shiaism. In fact, he kept denying towards his death. But his sister, Sultan Unisa Begum, whom I said, was, you know, very close to Shiaism. and uh, when she lost out actually in the fight for the throne uh, she went away on a pilgrimage to basra and that is where she died uh, her son raizul umra came, came back and uh, it is around umdatul umra's time that it is believed that the thousand lights mosque was built uh, thank you Uh, again, Balaji Dhanabani wants to know where does Raja Singh Desingu fits into the scene. Uh, it's very interesting. Raja Desingu, you know, comes uh, <clears throat> along with the. Uh, he is a descendant of Swaran Singh, who is a Rajput, uh, who is sent by Aurangzeb to take over uh, Senji Fort. You know, once Zulfikar Khan wins over the Marathas, and the Marathas leave uh, Senji, uh, it is handed over to this Rajput chieftain. Uh, so nobody ever, you know. questions as to why a hindu was given this fort you know after it's being taken over i think mughals you know did not look at it that way uh, but uh, i think by the time aurangzeb died uh, the weakening of the mughal rule uh, raja day singh you know comes to power you know by 1710 there are uh, the mughal power had started weakening and uh, each one was thinking of you know coming in on became powerful on their own raja day singh was a hot headed young man prince and uh, he wanted to assert independence of it and uh, so that is uh, during the saatullah khan's time so despite warning and all that you know he goes to fight and uh, he loses out to saatullah khan that is where raja day singh story comes and already answer the question there are sunni muslims or shia muslims i mean there are so many things that we can highlight uh, battle of ambur was where uh, the french forces supporting chanda sahib uh, uh, you know fell uh, uh, anwaruddin in 1749 and uh, anwaruddin was also treacherously killed uh, you know, by his own commanders 
So that is the thing of Battle of Ambu. That's a turning point. You know, with that, the French lose an upper hand. Yeah, I mean, there is this uh, Ravichandra Krishnamurti, you know, says that I remember the reading the British found secret correspondence between Umdhattu Umra and Tipu Sultan. And this was the reason why they took over. No, the British were already you know, planning to take over. They would needed uh, some reason. There were correspondence. Now, you can also, I mean, I would really, you know, find it as a, a con contemporary analogy will be the kind of uh, the weapons of mass destruction that they found uh, in Iraq. Uh, finally, you know, turning out to be uh, weapons of mass deception, you know, sex up reports. So we really cannot say anything of these things, but that was reused as a reason, uh, one of the reasons. Uh, so I think I have answered enough uh, questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please uh, do post. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, in the comment section itself, you know, you can post the questions. Uh, so I thank all, all of you on behalf of Kaiser Millet International Academy of Media Studies, as well as uh, Foundation for South Indian Studies. So with this, the fourth lecture of Madras Week 2020 comes to an end. Uh, tomorrow, we have a very interesting lecture. As I said, that is on the reorganization of states, fight for Madras, agitation for Madras, to retain Madras with uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, so in the 1950s, uh, Andhra wanted uh, Madras to be uh, its capital. So they sl slogan, uh, uh, they coined the slogan Madras Manade. So it was countered by the Tamil saying that Talai uh, Kurutin Kapu. And uh, finally, uh, it came to uh, Tamil Nadu, it came to be Tamil Nadu. So that was not the only thing, but across Tamil Nadu in various regions in southern Travancore, uh, in southern adjacent to Travancore, there were areas being lost in Munar and other places. So the fight was happening for territories across, you know, border areas. So LA beat to Poratam, that is how it's known. So T. Parmeshwari, who is the granddaughter of Mapo Sivanyanam, who fought for Madras, she is going to be talking about it. Please do join us uh, tomorrow uh, during the lecture. Uh, thank you once again.